the choir of St. George's Chapel, Windsor, sang Wesley's Thou Wilt Keep Him in Perfect Peace, when in June 1972, they laid to rest Britain's last surviving King Emperor. Although for the last 35 years or so of his life, he was a stranger to these shores. In December 1936, Edward VIII did the unthinkable and chose to abdicate from his throne and give up all his responsibilities for love. Now titled the Duke of Windsor, he left the castle under cover of darkness on a road that was to lead to exile. Ever since, the private details of what really occurred then and afterwards have been guarded here in Windsor Castle. Now, with access to literally thousands of documents preserved in the Royal Archives, high up in the Round Tower, we will discover the real facts behind that fateful moment in history. Apart from a set of coins, the odd souvenir mug and a few other memorabilia, such as this book plate in the Royal Library at Windsor, there is little to show of the reign that should have been. I've often wondered about the appalling shock my great-uncle and namesake, His Majesty King Edward VIII, inflicted upon his family when he abdicated his throne to marry Wallace Simpson 60 years ago. Even today there are those who cannot forgive him or her for that. Rarely this century has any story become surrounded by so much myth and legend, engendered such deep emotions and made or broken so many reputations. Which is why I want to discover what really happened during the many years the Duke and Duchess of Windsor lived alone in exile. Fort Belvedere, just a few miles from Windsor Castle, was Edward VIII's home when he was Prince of Wales. Much of the drama surrounding the uncrowned king's fateful decision took place here. I don't believe he thought for a moment that when he decided to abdicate, he would be saying goodbye to all this forever. The Duke honestly believed that after the abdication, he could go away for a while lie low and wait for the storm to blow over. And then he could return to here, pick up the threads of his old life, and pretend to be a younger brother to the new king, George VI. But he completely failed to understand the impact his decision to abdicate and to marry Wallace had on British and imperial opinion. And this was the essence of the tragedy, for it was to bring him into direct conflict with everyone, from the government to the man in the street, and most seriously of all, his family. It's difficult now to comprehend the state of shock in which the nation and empire were left when King Edward decided to abdicate, a man most people had come to know and love when he was the charismatic and popular Prince of Wales. He was born in 1894, the eldest son of George V and Queen Mary, christened Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David, but known to his family as simply David. When he acceded to the throne in 1936, he became emperor to a quarter of the world's population. But his affair with Wallace Simpson, a twice married American was to cast a dark shadow over all this. When the king said he wanted to marry her, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin confronted him. A 17-year-old secretary overheard them. Baldwin was really crying and he said, you really, you must not go. You must not abdicate. A few hours ago... But he did. I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been successful by my brother, the Duke of York. My first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. I was a schoolboy at a prep school, and we were taken into the, uh, to, to the big hall in the school, and we listened to the Duke give his speech. And a lot of us were in tears. I mean, we were appalled. It was very, very moving. I'll never forget it. And uh, we, we felt lost. We felt depressed because all of us loved him. I mean, all of us looked up to him and thought that he was going to be a great king. I mean, he was, he was sort of on our side, as it were. I think you have to remember, sir, that he was the first member of the royal family who really came down to the people. And uh, England couldn't believe 
that their beloved monarch was leaving them for about 24 hours. We feared that such was her to the nation, they might suddenly become a republic. Not only had Wallace Simpson been divorced once, she would have to divorce for a second time to marry the king, hence the crisis. I think it's quite difficult to understand now how powerfully people felt about that kind of thing. Because so many more people were divorced and, and, and emerged at the end of the war married to somebody else. We never really blamed him. We blamed her for everything. <laughs> the whole thing rather stank to us, you see. And, it, of course, divorce wasn't so common as it is now, but she, she had two husbands before, <laughs> which we thought was quite enough. Wallace Simpson certainly inspired strong feelings. Intense loathing, sir. Loathing that I very much fear uh, she could have been murdered. She was supposed to be the femme fatale. Who knows how Wallace must have felt. She'd been handed out of the country just days before the abdication. She too was now in exile, staying with friends in the south of France, surrounded by the world's press. Wallace is often depicted as hard, ambitious and grasping, there were other much worse descriptions flying around as well. But at one point, she must have realised what was going to happen, what she might be responsible for, and she tried to stop Edward. In a statement to the press just four days before the abdication, she stated her readiness to withdraw forthwith from the unhappy situation. She was distraught when the King telephoned her with the news of his decision. We all know that she was terribly upset and then she cried on the telephone because he told her that I'm leaving now, I've told them that I'm abdicating. And that's when it was a, an utter shock to her because she did not expect it. She started to cry and she said, oh no, please don't do it, you fool, you fool. No one was the abdication to have a greater tragic consequence than for the royal family. The children had developed a close bond through mutual support because their parents had always been remote and aloof from them. The true story of what really happened is here in the Library and Royal Archives at Windsor. Private letters, memos, telegrams, financial papers. They tell a story of sorrow and anger, romance and tragedy, and much personal pain, not only to the Duke, but also to the family he was leaving behind. Although they were stunned by the abdication, they showed genuine sympathy for the Duke. The Duchess of York, soon to become the new Queen, wrote, We are all overcome with misery and can only pray that you will find happiness in your new life and from his cousin, Princess Mary Louise. It is impossible to express what I feel for you in this hour of such momentous decision. Goodbye, David, my dear cousin and beloved sovereign. His aunt, the Countess of Athlone, wrote, Now that you are leaving us all, I want you to know how profoundly I grieve and how miserable I am for you. Your decision leads you at long last out of all this tragedy to that happiness which you've been seeking and never finding these many years. That the high and mighty prince Albert, Frederick, Arthur, George... But such private sympathies were suppressed. By the grace of God. It was totally impossible for people to react in any other way than they did. They all took this strong establishment view. What he did was unforgivable, whatever that may mean, except it does mean quite a lot, a major, visible dereliction of duty. I think as simple as that. To many, it was also a betrayal of trust. The officials of the royal household in particular felt disillusioned. Their first concern was to protect the monarchy. For that, they had to restore the public's confidence and to establish the new king, George VI, in the nation's affections and distance the old one as far as possible. The impact of that on the brothers and family was to be profound. Immediately after the abdication, the Duke headed for Austria, here, he was oblivious to the emotional backlash against him in Britain. He fully expected to return home with Wallace and have her accepted by his family. In the meantime, he would have to wait in Austria while she would remain in France until her divorce was finalised. The telephone was the principal means of communication, both between Britain and France. And within three months, he'd run up a bill of £800. Although there are no records of what was exchanged, we do know that the connections were never particularly good and the calls were often strained and frequently caused much pain. He was very much the elder brother of your grandfather and your uncles. And uh, he therefore rather felt he must tell his brother 
all the pitfalls and all the things he must do, which were not obviously quite well received. It was principally to end this ordeal that the king turned to Walter Monckton, a trusted friend of both he and the duke, to act as a mediator. It was a role that was to involve Monckton in a number of delicate missions. He had to go over to the duke and say, please, is it necessary to call your brother so often? Because he was not a very strong man and it upset him. This constant interference with state matters did nothing to improve his relationship with officialdom. May 1937 saw the coronation of George VI on the same day that had been planned for Edward VIII. The Duke was not there. He was making plans for his wedding in June and naturally expecting his family to support him on what he regarded as the most important day of his life. In France, head over heels in love, he was blind to the emotions that were still running high. It was decided after much pressure from Lord Wigram, the King's acting Her Royal Highness. With a great deal of anxiety, I said, I very much fear, sir, that His uh, Majesty has not been pleased to grant the title of Royal Highness to the Duchess of Windsor. It came to His Royal Highness as a shock from the blue. It completely shattered him. And although he was not a man ever to show his emotions greatly, he then, much to my embarrassment and distress, burst into tears on my shoulder. And uh, all he said was, well, Dudley, you'll always consider she's worthy of it, won't you? The legal position probably was that she was entitled to it. Um, but the, the, the view was that she certainly shouldn't get it, nor did she. And I think that was obviously something he minded very much. And there was worse to come. Not a single member of the royal family attended the wedding. I don't think that, that any of his close family had an intention of going there. I think he must have been deeply disappointed. I think there's no doubt that he hoped they would come either all, which was perhaps not unreasonable, or at least some, which he certainly thought was reasonable, and they didn't. The king wrote him a long and painful letter. I can't treat this as just a private family matter, however much I want to. I'm afraid it will not be possible for any of the family to come out to your wedding. I simply hate having to tell you this, but you must realise that in spite of the affection which there still is towards you personally, the vast majority of the people of this country are undoubtedly as strongly as ever opposed to a marriage which caused a King of England to renounce the throne be regarded as condoning all that's happened and would be harmful to the monarchy. This is a matter where I can't act like a private person and I've had to get advice from ministers. My parents never talked about it. My mother was very buttoned up and reticent about that kind of thing. Uh, if I ever, uh, so to speak, heard them say anything about it, they always stopped when I appeared. And I think that was very much a, a, a family view at the time. The excuse of potential damage to the monarchy was the official line in trying to balance the family's private feelings with a public attitude they were being advised to adopt had unwittingly started a war. The Duke felt his wife had been insulted by his family and he blamed his brother George and his mother Queen Mary. After the reception, Monckton took the Duchess aside. He warned her that the Duke's happiness for the rest of his life would alone reconcile the British people to his choice of her. She is reported to have replied, Walter, don't you think I've thought of all that? I think I can make him happy. He deeply, deep of his life that he could not give up. She had a tremendous sense of humor and she had a lot of energy and she kept things going and it was enormous fun around her. Le Duc, il avait the Duke had found in the Duchess of Windsor his mother, his nurse and his wife all at once. But he behaved like an adolescent. I have to tell you, I honestly think she really made his world. Made his world. He, he loved her. He told me that she was the only person that really, truly was fond of me and took care of me and loved me. That's how he fell in love with her, he told me. Because he said he never had much love in his life as a young man. I'm sure he would have been a different man if he'd had a lot of love from his mother and father. 
give me a present which I think you would like to see. The interesting thing about it is what's written inside. It says, for dear David, from his affectionate parents, and it's got G, R, I, and M. <laughs> yes, not exactly very personal. <laughs> Can you imagine that? A birthday present, a birthday present to his son. And his father calls himself Rex Imperator. The final straw came with the unveiling of this tomb to the Duke's father in March 1939. Just a year earlier, the Duke had written to his mother, Queen Mary, I hope that when the statue is finished, and formally unveiled and handed over to St George's, that contrary to the practice of avoiding all mention of anything that could recall one to the public mind, an exception will be made in this case, and you will let it be known publicly that I have shared with you the privilege of giving the memorial. It was actually dedicated in the presence of the King and Queen, Queen Mary and other members of the royal family. Even though he had paid half the cost, the Duke wasn't even told the ceremony was taking place. He was furious. I greatly regret that it should have taken so sacred an occasion to disclose so much that is unpleasant and to destroy the last vestige of feeling I had left for you all as a family. The incident was a culmination of all these events and actions, plus rapidly deteriorating communications, intransigence, perceived slights, and most significantly, long and painful months of negotiation over a financial settlement. As with many a family, it was money that caused the real trouble. The initial agreement was that the Duke would receive £25,000 a year from Parliament, worth 20 times that in today's terms, and he agreed to sell Balmoral and Sandringham, which he owned, to his brother. In the event, Parliament refused to pay up. Then it was discovered that the Duke actually had £1 million in the bank, worth £20 million today, and finally they couldn't agree a fair value for the royal estates. The result was a wrangle out of his own resources half of which would come from the sale of Balmoral and Sandringham. The whole sorry escapade left a nasty taste in the mouth. The new king was forced to borrow to keep the estates, because he had not inherited the traditional income of a Prince of Wales. The financial impact on the royal family's private resources was disastrous. Money that would normally have been inherited by a new king disappeared with the Duke of Windsor, and King George started with virtually empty coffers. The Duke's inability to understand his brother's position public opinion and the fact that you can't have two kings in one country made conflict almost inevitable. All these factors and events combined to produce one of the major elements of the tragedy, the breakdown of relations between the Duke and his family. They inevitably blamed Wallace, who became even more despised, which made it all the more difficult for the Duke to return. Yet, he continued to remain optimistic, especially about his prospects for a job. To those who knew the Duke well, the issue of a job was uppermost in his mind from the moment he left the country. Exactly as Monckton had feared, boredom and alienation were to become the Duke's worst enemies. The novelty being married was short-lived, and soon he was craving for company, for political conversation and mental stimulus. It should have been in everyone's interest to keep him occupied, or at least well advised, but nothing happened. Undoubtedly, there was nervousness, since during the short time he was king, he had acquired a very bad reputation. The red boxes that contained the state and confidential papers were often found unlocked and papers littered around his study, which gave rise to rumours that he, or at least Wallace, was a security risk. So when no job was offered, the Duke took the initiative himself. In October 1937, he accepted an invitation from Hitler to visit Germany. If you have been the Prince of Wales and uh, Edward VIII, you were a little bit apt to think, even though you've abdicated, that you still have that kind of power. He did believe that if he saw Hitler face to face, that he would prevent him from making war. Next, it was not going to be possible for Dr. Windsor ever to experience a state visit. On the other hand, this invitation we had uh, allowed her to experience that. The Duke and Duchess visited Field Marshal Goering at his home. When we were touring the whole house with the Field Marshal, we came to his study, and behind his desk was a marquetry map of Europe, with the whole of Europe in one kind of brown, 
and Great Britain into a lighter, greeny kind of brush, the innuendo, and turned round to the felt marshal and said, um, that is impertinent. Finally, the Duke and Duchess went to meet Hitler. When we arrived, to the Duke's surprise, Hitler refused to talk to him direct in German, because, of course, the Duke was fluent in it. He took great pains to put to Hitler all the arguments, which were very many, that war couldn't pay. And we were only there, I remember, so for half an hour, and he left with great distress. He failed. It was an ideal opportunity for his enemies to declare him pro-Nazi, and the image of the Duke waving his arm in the air in what looked suspiciously like a Nazi salute was to stick with him. The press has said that Hitler told the Duke of Windsor that in certain eventualities he would place him back on the British throne. Now that is completely untrue. Had even that been said, such was his Royal Highness's uh, devotion and loyalty to his brother, I know in his characters I did, he would have walked out straight away in rage. It was one of those press inaccuracies that, alas, did both he and the Duchess great harm. Mm. So, I mean, do you believe that the Duke ever collaborated in any way or sympathised with the Nazis? No, sir. He was a very, very loyal British subject. But the visit showed a serious lack of judgment and did nothing to help his calls back home. By 1938, the Duke and Duchess had gravitated towards the French Riviera, the playground of the rich and famous in the south of France, which was also the home to many other exiles. It was here that the Duke and Duchess acquired their first home, La Croix, on the Cap d'Antibes. What a stunning place it must have been, with this glorious setting with a fabulous view. And here they spent much of their life, entertaining and being entertained, until this idyll was rudely interrupted by the outbreak of the Second World War. The Duke was caught unawares, still wanting to believe that war was avoidable and indeed unlikely. After an absence of nearly three years, the Duke of Windsor is back in England. His Royal Highness crossed from France with the Duchess in a destroyer, landing at Portsmouth where they were welcomed by the Commander-in-Chief before leaving for this house in Sussex. War brought two positive outcomes. He was allowed to return to Britain and he was given a job. was back in Paris with a British military mission where his contacts might be valuable in helping to ascertain France's military capacity and intentions. He began enthusiastically, but it became obvious to him that his reports were not read and he felt there was a campaign against him. He tried to get back to England to complain and wrote to Moncton, The recent exposure of a network of intrigue against me makes my position here both impossible and intolerable. The nature of this latest campaign of outrage against me is so virulent that I wish to seek both yours and Winston's advice before seeing the King. To Churchill, now in the War Cabinet, he complained bitterly of fresh evidence of my brother's continued efforts to humiliate me. But Churchill took a surprisingly tough line, no doubt fed up with his constant selfish complaining. Having voluntarily resigned the finest throne in the world, and having been for so many years Prince of Wales and afterwards King Emperor, it would be natural to treat all minor questions of ceremony and procedure as entirely beneath your interest and your dignity. At a time like this, when everybody is being ordered about, and millions of men are taken from their homes to fight, it may be for long years, and many others ruined. It is especially necessary to be dependent in one spirit against extreme misfortunes. Frustrated once again, the Duke became disinterested and disheartened. News of this reached Berlin, their interest aroused by loose talk at the Windsor's dinner parties. In May 1940, Germany invaded France and advanced on Paris. The Duke immediately took the Duchess to Biarritz, and when he returned to Paris, his commanding officer told him to go south, which he did, but in the process abandoned his friend and equerry, Fruity Metcalf. Metcalf was less than impressed. My position here since you left has been impossible, and while I cannot stand, I have not had one word from you, sir, and so can only surmise that you intend to stay where you now are. I'm sorry, sir, to leave your service, but I feel sure that it's the only thing to do. 
Metcalf later insinuated the Duke had deserted, and though not true, the story took root. It's indicative of how he managed to alienate even his closest friends. June the 10th, 1940, Mussolini declared war and Italy invaded France. The Duke and Duchess were having lunch with Maurice Chevalier when news came, and as the border with Italy is only 30 miles away, they had to get out and fast. France was in chaos. Paris was abandoned and the Germans were racing south towards Bordeaux. The Windsors hurriedly packed and hid everything while making hasty escape plans for the local consul general. They decided not to make for Bordeaux, where the remnants of the British Embassy were escaping from, but to head for Spain. It was a decision that was to involve the Duke and Duchess in the most bizarre episode of their lives. Recognised the Duke as the Prince of Wales, who had served in the Great War, and let him through. The best route was along the coast, towards the Pyrenees, and the border crossing into Spain. Thousands of others had the same idea. The road was packed with refugees, with their possessions fleeing from the invading armies. Making for neutral Spain was a risk. There was no guarantee they would be let in, and at Perpignan, 10 miles from the border, they were turned away by the Spanish consulate, who refused them the entry visas they needed. All transport was at a standstill, so there could be no going back. The Duke sent off telegrams to the British ambassador in Madrid and the Spanish ambassador in Bordeaux, who were friends of his. And at last, permission to cross the frontier was granted. At the border, there was even more chaos. The Duke said, it was absolutely terrible. All these people with little pieces of paper in their hands were running up and saying, if I don't get across the border, I'm going to be killed. And I said, well, didn't it occur to you that you now you and the Duchess were not going to be killed, but these people were? He said, why? I was the King of England. After four days on the road, the Duke and Duchess arrived in Madrid and, with relief, made for an old haunt, the Ritz. But now in a fascist regime, they immediately became the focus of political intrigue. Nosotros con, eh, con Hitler teníamos we had a difficult relationship with Hitler because he was a difficult man. But we always wanted our relationship with Germany to be a good one. For us, of course, Germany represented an important barrier against the Russians, which was the principal reason for our friendship with the Germans. The German ambassador in Madrid was ordered by Berlin to try to keep the Windsors in Spain. They were constantly watched by the German secret service based opposite the Ritz at the Palace Hotel. As it turned out, the Germans needn't have bothered. The Windsors intention to catch a boat back to Britain for Portugal was delayed because they didn't want to be in Lisbon at the same time as his brother, the Duke of Kent who was on an official visit. The Duke of Windsor used the opportunity to start arguing for terms and conditions for his return, but he wanted a job and official recognition of his wife first. Meanwhile, his prolonged stay encouraged the Germans to enlist Spanish help to keep him where he was, in Spain. They approached the Spanish Minister of the Interior and brother-in-law to General Franco, Serrano Suna. Franco and us gustaba que estuviera aquí. They wanted to keep the king here, the king of England. Franco and all of us wanted to keep him here because we thought that he would be an English king more favorably disposed to Spain. On the other hand, Hitler thought he could manipulate him like a pawn, so he could instigate revolution in England. Meanwhile in London, His Majesty's government is becoming twitchy. 
The Duke's behaviour in negotiating terms before he will even consider returning to England seem, under the circumstances, extraordinary. But there he is, demanding a job for himself and acceptance of the Duchess by the royal family. Churchill fires off a telegram, ordering the Duke to return in no uncertain terms. Your Royal Highness has taken active military rank, and refusal to obey direct orders of competent military authority would create a serious situation. I must strongly urge immediate compliance with the wishes of the government. The Duke did not receive the telegram then, because he was already on his way to Lisbon. There, the British Embassy advised him to stay with Ricardo Espiritu Santo, a wealthy banker whose home was at the appropriately named Boca do Inferno, or the Jaws of Hell, for Santo turned out to be a German sympathiser. Having had no reply to his earlier telegram, Churchill seeks an audience with the King. The Duke must be removed from the continent, but how if he won't return to England? It's decided to send him to the Bahamas as governor, a post without precedence for a member of the royal family. The Duke's attempt at bargaining had totally backfired, and he was now to be sent further into exile. On one of his almost daily visits to the British Embassy in Lisbon, the Duke received Churchill's latest telegram, informing him of his appointment as governor of the Bahamas. He was dismayed at the news, but nevertheless accepted, at least as a governor's wife, Wallace would now be his equal. So began a new round of negotiations, including the release from military duty of some of his former staff. Most significantly, he was stuck in Portugal until a boat passage could be arranged. Villi to lure him back to Spain. Angel, a Spanish secret agent, was sent to the Duke with a message. I took a letter for him, which was given to me by the Minister of the Government, Mr. Serrano Sunier. He didn't tell me who the letter was from or what it was about, but from the envelope, and everything I knew, it was from Franco. The Nazis told me to tell him that when the war was over, we would make him King of England, and we would put the crown on his head and the swastika on his car. When I told him, the Duke laughed a lot. Operation Vili now effectively commences. The aim is twofold, to delay the Duke from leaving for the Bahamas and to persuade him to return to Spain. The real aim of the plot was the negotiated peace between Great Britain and the Nazis. And then uh, uh, the, 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 behind there was a condition which was, could be the recovering the, the crown for, uh, for uh, the Duke of Windsor. The Duke is unaware of these machinations and plays perfectly into the hands of the plotters when he seeks their assistance to recover various items, including sheets and pillowcases, from his houses in France. With Europe engulfed in war, the Windsor's preoccupation was bed linen for Government House in the Bahamas. The plotters allowed their maid to travel unhindered through German lines and all the way into occupied Paris to get it. But at the Windsor's home at 24 Boulevard Suchet, she was picked up by two overcoat-clad men who held her there and stopped her from catching the return train. The plan was to force the Windsors to postpone their departure. Meanwhile, the Duke and Duchess entertained in Lisbon while they waited for their bed linen and a boat. They were now surrounded by spies, reporting any hint of disloyalty, such as a claim that the Duke said that if the Germans bombed London, the British would capitulate. The Duke still found time, though, to play some golf, even presenting a trophy at the Estoril Golf Club. Meanwhile, the Duke's negotiations with London continue. Churchill telegrams... I regret that there can be no question of releasing men from the army to act as servants to your royal highness. Such a step would be viewed with general disapprobation in times like these, and I should ill-serve your royal highness by countenancing it. So from all the evidence, it appears the Duke was naive and impressionable. Much of the negotiation was absurd in content and smacks of extraordinary selfishness. Now, it's quite possible the Duchess was behind much of it, not out for revenge, but out of an absurd sense of loyalty, persuading him not to be pushed around by remarkably petty issues. Walter Monckton advised Churchill to soften his line and allow one man to be released from the army to join the Duke's staff. But seemingly trivial arguments over staff hid much greater concerns in London. 
The breaking of German military codes within the first year of the war gave Britain an unexpected but highly delicate intelligence advantage. On the one hand, they knew exactly what was going on in Spain and Portugal. On the other, the government couldn't act in any way that might reveal their knowledge to the Germans. The crunch came when the Duke wrote that it would be more diplomatic to sell on August the 8th instead of August the 1st. This causes real panic here, because it's clear the German plot is working. Churchill immediately sends Monckton to Lisbon on what he later describes as another very odd job. Monckton's task was to counter whatever the plotters were saying. In fact, they were trying to convince the Duke that the British Secret Service was out to assassinate him. The Germans sent a letter offering him safe passage to Spain. It was delivered by Angel. The Duke, he took it and looked at it. He read it first, quickly, and then, more slowly, and said, it's too late. It's too late. In a last desperate bid, the plotters tried new tactics. A gang of thugs was sent to the house with instructions to frighten the Duke into asking for protection. He did persuade the Duke in the end, but it was very hard. He, he had to almost walk up the steps to the ship uh, to get him on. He thought of every excuse, you know, and he, couldn't he come back and do some work in England? Couldn't he? It'd just be something to help the war effort. And my father had to say no. At 6.40 on the evening of August, First, the SS Excalibur sailed from Lisbon, with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor safely on board and en route to the Bahamas at last. There is no doubt that in London the picture created by all the intercepted messages between Germany, Spain and Portugal must have been deeply worrying. On their evidence alone, it would be easy to brand the Duke a traitor, if you disregard the fact that they were written to cooperate with the Spanish and the Germans. Of necessity, when it was to necessary, not of his own free will. He thought, like many English, that the, the war was lost. And for the sake of England, he maybe was looking for a negotiated peace with the Germans. I think he never tried to cooperate with the Nazis, and of course he never tried to become uh, the, I would say, the, the British uh, Pétain. The Duke had been badly treated in England by his friends and family, and by everybody because they couldn't understand him. He was a man who said to me that for him, there was only one thing in the world. For him, life began and ended in England. The extent of Operation Vili first became known just after the war, when some German foreign ministry documents known as the Marburg Papers were captured. There was immediate speculation about the Duke's willing involvement in the plot, which he swiftly denied. But the allegations that he collaborated with the Nazis, or even considered betraying his country, continued to be made. There are even claims that secret documents pertaining to the Duke's association with the Nazis were removed from Germany on the express orders of King George VI and have been destroyed or buried somewhere. In fact, they were all private family letters between Queen Victoria and her eldest daughter, who'd been married to Kaiser Frederick. The concern was that they might be looted. None of them was dated after 1901 and certainly don't refer to the Duke of Windsor. The Duke may have been awkward, selfish and intransigent to deal with. He may also have been loose-tongued and in favour of appeasement. But there is no evidence that he would have ever betrayed his country or agreed to be a puppet king. Such accusations were only directly levelled at him after he had died, when he could no longer defend himself. Being sent to the Bahamas for the Duke was like Napoleon being sent to St Helena. It was for him the equivalent of being sent into exile. The only consolation was that Wallace would be treated as his equal as governor's wife. But it was small comfort that he was going to have to sit out the war, frustrated at not being able to help his country in a more constructive way. All along, he must have dreamt of returning to Britain. What 
life when you've been king of a large country. I mean, how could you own practically half the world? And then suddenly told you're going to look after a tiny, tiny place in the, at the Palmas. I mean, he thought it was terrible, but my father was pleased because he was worried that the Duke might easily be shot or caught or anything might have happened. It's rather sad. It was... The governorship of the Bahamas was his biggest test. The impression he created would be vital. I first met the Duke first on board the yacht Southern Cross, which belonged to a Swede who had loaned his boat to bring the Duchess. She had a toothache and she never liked to fly until she came in this yacht, which was very, very comfortable. And the Duchess and I are naturally very glad to set foot in America again. Although it is pretty tough on her to have to undergo a dental operation. I remember very distinctly a very small, very sunburned little man said, ah, you're the consul from Jacksonville. How very good of you to come on board, you know. And I was quite disarmed by this approach. Uh, he, he had tremendous charm and charisma. I thought he did a very fine job as, as the governor. He, um, he didn't spend an awful lot of time in the office, but he didn't like the office. He didn't like paperwork. But um, he was very popular with the Bahamians. I mean, obviously the big question is, if he did well as, as the governor of the Bahamas, why was it that he didn't get a job after that? Um, I don't know. I think it was difficulty about Wallace, really. She just didn't fit in somehow. The Windsor's friendship with Swedish financier Axel Wenner-Gren was another cause for criticism. Suspected as pro-Nazi, he was blacklisted by the American and British governments, although the accusation was unproven. And then there was another major setback. He had an appalling accident, let's face it, in the Bahamas when this very visible murder of a, of a, of a very known citizen was there, and that can't have been easy to handle and probably, possibly, wasn't well handled. The Duke's reputation as governor was almost destroyed by the lurid murder of Sir Harry Oakes, who was found battered to death in July 1943. The Duke made the mistake of summoning help from the Miami police, who bungled their investigation so badly that no murderer was ever convicted. I think that was a, a minus mark, not a plus mark. Um, and I suppose the establishment who decided or recommended people for the, for the rather important kind of job he might have had, I suppose they were not only uh, doubtful about him, but they were more than doubtful about her. They didn't like her. They didn't fancy an American voice as one of the voices of, of this country. The 20,000-ton American troop ship Argentina, as I saw her anchored in Plymouth Sound, within sight of the shores of Britain. Aboard her were the Duke and Duchess of Windsor on their way at home. In answer to a question I put to him, the Duke said, I'm coming back to England in the early part of October. At the first opportunity, once the war had ended, the Duke resigned his post and made his way via America back to Europe. His dream was probably to return here to his beloved Port Belvedere, his former home and the place where many of the crisis meetings prior to the abdication took place. But this dream, along with his hopes of a job and acceptance of his wife by his family, were to be dashed. The Duke has made it plain that the present move to Paris has nothing permanent about it. He is set on bringing his wife to his homeland and to a home of their own. The Duke's expectations remained wildly over-optimistic. In reality, he was never to see Fort Belvedere again. And it was to be a few more difficult years before he became resigned to the inevitable, that he was not to be given a job, that his wife would never be accepted by his family, and that he would not be allowed to live in Britain permanently. In the end, he accepted that he was an exile. As it turned out, once they became reconciled to this fact, the Duke and Duchess set about creating a lifestyle and image that was to make them one of the most alluring icons of the 20th century. be invited again to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor's soirees, and thank God. Rarely have I been so stupendously bored. 
There were 22 people for dinner, and only two names did I know or remember, and that was from history. The Count and Countess of Bismarck. It is extraordinary how small the Duke and Duchess are. Two tiny figures like Tito and the net that you keep on the mantelpiece. Chipped around the edges. Marred royalty. Charming and feckless. At one point I said to the Duchess, You are, without any question, the most vulgar woman I have ever met. Richard Burton wrote that in his diary after an evening here in 1968. But in spite of it, he and Elizabeth Taylor came again several times. Well, few ever declined. You didn't say no to an invitation from the Duke and Duchess of Windsor to visit their private home in the Bois de Boulogne. The traumas of abdication, divorce and war were behind them. And in exile, they were fated and flattered by people the Duke would probably never even have known, but for a chance encounter with a divorced American woman who changed his life. When they moved here in 1953, they had been married for 16 years. The Duke was no longer engaged in a feud with his family, who he felt had insulted his wife, or in the political intrigue of trying to prevent their exile. That was all in the past. The wartime German occupation was a fading memory when they signed the lease with the city of Paris. My grandfather, King George VI, who had literally been catapulted onto the throne when Edward gave up his crown, had reigned and then died at a tragically early age. He was only 57. Queen Elizabeth, my mother, was the new monarch. And now, for the first time, the Duke of Duchess had a permanent home. And they set about creating a way of life and the image that went with it. The Duke and Duchess became the leading lights of what could be called the International Café Society. An endless round of social events, entertaining and being entertained. It was all a million miles from his destiny as King of England. They went out quite a lot. They would be seen and photographed at the Maxims, at, uh, at night uh, clubs and all that. And I think uh, it filled up their uh, diary, you see. I think they liked it. She liked it a lot. He created this whole mythical kingdom. He designed the uniforms for all the waiters and the footmen. And uh, on a gala night, they were in red outside with the flaming torches. On less formal occasions, they were in tails, and everything was arranged around him. Elsa Max wants to come and play the piano here quite often. Cole Porter, people like that. But it was a very gay evening, always. Our party was always a success. And that was her life, entertaining. That's Queen Mary, the Duke's mother, whom she called him David, as did all his family and friends. And it's fascinating to find the portrait in such a prominent position, given the fairly turbulent nature of their relationship after his abdication. It's difficult to judge whom she blamed more, Wallace for so utterly bewitching David, or David for abandoning his responsibilities and duties for something so transient as love. And as long as she lived, Queen Mary could never understand or forgive that. The villa, meticulously restored by Mohammed al-Fayed, reveals something of what Wallace and David wanted in their new life. There is also much to impress upon the visitor, exactly whose house it was. Throughout, there are constant reminders of his life as Prince of Wales, and even his short spell as king. But they are merely glimpses of a world he gave up in order to marry Wallace. There is no shortage of these, rather good photos of his wife. It may be hard to appreciate in this day and age just what an appalling shock she was to the court and the British establishment 60 years ago. It wasn't because she was American, and it certainly wasn't because she was a married woman having a serious affair with David. Over the years, he'd had relationships with married ladies, and in those days, that was understood and accepted, so long as it didn't get out. Now, it was frankly because Wallace was a divorced woman, and divorced women were just not accepted in society, let alone in Palestine. And she would have to divorce for a second time in order to marry the king. But when Edward was determined to marry her, there was no alternative. He would have to step down. Poor Wallace. She was handed out of the country, despised and blamed for the abdication. The effect on the country was massive shock and a sense of betrayal for which they never forgave him. His frustration at not being allowed to return to Britain and his inability to understand that his wife could not be accepted by his family led to a bitter feud, most especially with his brother. But by the time they came to live here in Paris, all that was in the past though the emotional scars carried by everybody involved were still very tender.
there obviously was opposition to him being given a job, uh, which probably would have been out of the country, almost certainly, uh, either as a roving ambassador or as a governor or whatever it might have been like that. Any of those things might have worked. Um, and I suppose they do rather go together. Because, of course, here, uh, in this country, he would have, I imagine, have been very much in the position of a private citizen, even if a highly connected one with a very visible past. The Duke would often say to me, Joanne, you have no idea of what I gave up. I really didn't. Until one time there was a big celebration of something and I suddenly realized he gave up all of that. Plus the money, the jewels. You know, it's like I made my decision and I love her and I've settled for this kind of a life. And it was a relaxed life in the villa in the Bois de Boulogne. They were by now in their late 50s a surprisingly active couple who entertained vigorously, so the mornings were generally quiet. The Duke would wake late and have breakfast in bed, read the newspapers, and his valet, Sidney, would tell him the weather and temperature. For Wallace, the morning ritual tended to start slightly earlier. She loved her bath and bathroom, and she spent a great deal of time in here. She would never emerge from her suite before 11 o'clock, by which time she would look immaculate. The Duke, on the other hand, hated baths and had his covered up by a heavy piece of mahogany. He much preferred the more American habit of showering and had this one built specially. The Duke, as a noted leader of fashion, would consider very carefully his dress and what to be seen in. Everyone was delighted to follow his lead. He was born to perfect taste and his collaboration with his tailors was historic and very, very important. He hated extra pomp and solemnity. Most men would be wearing top hats today if he hadn't abolished them. He brought a lot of color into fashion, a lot of mixed patterns, which are now classic. For the Duchess, clothing represented a chance to show her obsession with style. It was an endless pursuit that made her the ultimate fashion model. Oh dear, look at who's dear, look at the she became a kind of icon because she set a fashion and her taste was very, very remarkable. One of the most interesting things about her is she's one of the few plain women to become a fashion icon. As far as I'm concerned, I've been very influenced by her because she, she knew so well, you know, and teach to a young designer what really is essential for a woman to be elegant, nothing over-elaborate to cut us to be. Perfect but simple. The Duchess, especially in the earlier period of, of when she was very well known, had a breathless quality about her way of dressing. People were waiting to see what she was going to wear. Her entrance was really part of the evening. Quand je la coiffais, quand même elle faisait, je peux dire les lifting, oui. When I did her hair while she was having, can I say, a facelift, she was obsessed with seeing how she appeared, even if she had just had a face. She immediately thought about having something done again, some small touches like that on the right, on the left. She was obsessed by what she wanted to represent. That was her great obsession. I used to say to her sometimes, why don't you take up some child work here in Paris, like you do in the Bahamas? She said, Sydney, I was locked up on that island for five years, and there were no in German, as you know, nowhere to go. Now I left, I come to Paris where I first started, and I am going to join myself. And that's just what she did. She entertained the hairdressers, the beauty parlors, and the couturier. The search for style was pursued with an almost manic zeal. No fashion show was truly complete without the attendance of the Duchess. With all the important decisions safely behind them, the Duchess might spend the morning dealing with the staff and perhaps working on the menu for a forthcoming party. Duke got down to his paperwork, usually in here. He opened the mail, did the checks, checked the accounts. And he wrote letters, social and business ones. But he no longer wrote with anger and frustration as he had done in the first years of his exile. And so the day would pass. After a light lunch, perhaps a nap. Maybe a chat to a friend on the telephone. Or a romp with the pug dogs in the garden. And then tea. The Duke drank a lot of tea and she often scolded him for letting it go cold cup and slowly the evening would approach and i looked at her coming down those stairs she was she looked like a 16 year old girl 
and I used to bow to her. I said, how beautiful you look. She would say, thank you. She'd come in, she'd say, everything is perfect. She'd walk on the terrace and see that all the candles and the trees were flooded. She said, Denny, make it a beautiful night tonight. In everything they did, there was an extraordinary attention to detail, a clever mixture of British tradition with American... Always very agreeable light. No, no bad face. You started curtsying to the Duke of Windsor and the Duchess. You had a drink, a uh, quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, not more, with Sydney, with a be beautiful red coat they brought him from Bahamas. And tiny, tiny appetizer, and champagne, and what you want for drink. But not more than a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. And then on to the dinner, because the Duchess said, the dinner can't wait for the guests. The guests have got to wait for the dinner. If you want good food. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, they wore evening dress for dinner every night, whether there were guests coming or not. The Duke, who was always first to be ready, would be waiting for Wallace to offer his arm and escort her to the dining room. Often, she was late, but he always remained just here, waiting. Sometimes it looked as if she might never come, and after a while, a servant would bring a chair, and he would sit, smoke a cigarette, and weep. When they tired of Paris, they travelled in style. Their faces were in all the papers, the very embodiment of the international jet set. Biritz, Antibes, Palm Beach, the Côte d'Azur. Glamorous royals in movie star settings. In fact, anywhere but Britain. After a while, there was nothing really much for them to do, except that they didn't, couldn't go to England. I didn't want to go to England. Um, and it was probably a better idea that they didn't go to England. And where else to come? But I'd met a lot of uh, sort of cafe society people who came over to Paris and who dined with them, and then they would return, and everybody gave dinner parties for them. And then the circle grew larger and larger, and that's why they started coming over in June. Duke and Duchess never travelled by aeroplane because of her fear of flying. The Atlantic crossing would take about a week. Invariably, news of their arrival would precede them, and New York society would be waiting to welcome them with open arms. Even in those days, New York was a city of skyscrapers. It was a hustling, noisy place. So just what exactly was the attraction for the Duke and Duchess? Why did they make this annual pilgrimage? Did they feel they had some common with all those emigrants who'd flocked to the New World? And if so, why didn't they stay? Or was it something else? Before they arrived, everybody knew that they were coming. And uh, they brought a great deal of energy with them. For instance, in the shops, everybody wanted to decorate. Uh, both the Duke and the Duchess were very sensitive to what was beautiful, well arranged, well presented. And <clears throat> everyone wanted to be ready in case they would have to visit. The Waldorf Towers was ideally located for what the Duke and Duchess wanted. Here in the heart of Manhattan, they had easy access to the fashion shows, the shopping and the parties. Everybody was happy and then the telephone started ringing and never stopped ringing. As well known, when, when the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were in town, I mean, people would literally kick and fight to get invited to an event that they were at or to be able to sit at a party they were at or to be in the same boat crossing the Atlantic that they were at. It was quite a phenomenon here in America. They were America's royalty. I thought, my goodness, what am I supposed to call them? Do I say, your royal highness, your what, and what do I call her? Because we've read all about the fact that you're not, it wasn't going to be the royal highness. Of the... Perhaps, you know, as they could not go to England, basically, that it was Perhaps refreshing to go to a country where at least a group made a fuss over them. Duchess, uh, those flowers, I, I know that's one of your favorite pastimes. Uh, did you make the arrangements? Well, I did, and they're geraniums, which are very, very simple flowers, which I love. I like them cut, and I like them in pots also. We always have them in the mill, lots around in pots, and these I cut. Found some place where I could get them and cut them, because it's typically me as an arrangement. Mountains of flowers, literally mountains of flowers of the Beautiful flowers were waiting there. 
I suspect they didn't have all that much money, and Mrs. Hilson paid for something, uh, who lived at the Waldorf. I can't remember whether she paid for the flowers. Somebody else paid for the limousine. Somebody else paid for, I don't know, the clothes or the... I mean, there was a group of three or four people who, who definitely paid for... for um, who subsidised them. Now, once more, try for another thousand. Sixty-four <laughs> dollar question. That's right. We have no prizes on this, but we'll send you a thousand jacks for that last one. <laughs> there. Is that enough? Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you'll teach me that game someday, darling. I love it. <laughs> they set up home here for two months every year in what is now called the Royal Suite. On the top floor, it's quieter and more spacious than in the hotel. It was made more homely because friends lent them Renoirs or Monets for the walls and ensured there were plenty of fresh flowers. Today, you'd be expected to pay around $3,500 a night to stay, but you do get some pretty magnificent views. We kept rotating pictures around, and I recall a Renoir, a uh, Pizarro. I mean, they were very good paintings, maybe not the top of the line for the whole collection, but, you know. On an extra fortnight, as they sometimes did, one or two of these people, one in particular, used to get quite angry and um, because it meant that the limo or the flowers um, had to be paid for for another two weeks. But I'm afraid that's the way it was, and uh, the princes gave good value. I mean, they could trot them out as their status friends and introduce them to their less status friends, and um, so it seemed to me that they got their money's worth. Nobody minded here that they had no job. They were accepted for what they were and allowed to do what they wanted. They had a number of good friends here and there were no restrictions on them. All of which is why I think America was an escape for them, an escape from the feeling of exile which dogged them in Europe. However, there was a penalty to pay. They would have to mix with people that they may not naturally have chosen to be with. They constantly had to be the leaders of style and fashion and it was an incessant round of socialising. There was a couple, Bob and Ethel Skull, who had a fleet of cabs, and I'll never forget a dinner given by um, some nice, rich friends of the Windsors who, who used to look after them a bit. And uh, we were all there on time, and uh, the Windsors were announced, and we all got up except for Mrs. Skull, who sank back into an armchair. And when the Duke and Duchess came round to, s to be introduced, she held out her hand to be kissed by the Duke, who, being extraordinarily well-mannered, took it and kissed it. But the Duchess hissed so that we could all hear the cheek of that bitch. Both the Duke and Duchess preferred small dinners. Their great pleasure was six for dinner. The Duchess uh, wanted to keep the uh, dinner very informal and relaxed. To start, they would have a cold soup or consommé, and then it would be this wonderful sea bass with uh, cucumbers in a very light uh, cream sauce or a chicken, roasted chicken with herbs. Then to end, we would have the Roman raisin ice cream, which was uh, the Duke uh, of Windsor favorite. His Royal Highness was not really always so keen about going out. The Duchess liked to go out, to see people whom she knew, whom they knew. Also, she always thought about entertaining the Duke. And she was afraid that if he would stay home too much, too often, he would possibly uh, get a little melancholy. And once he was on his way, he was happy, but to get him on his way was not always what he had wished. <laughs> the Duke had this um, habit of talking German, and I don't know whether it was after... It used to be towards the end of dinner, and he would suddenly turn on some nice church lady occasionally and start talking in German which didn't go down too well, and he would start saying, but this is his meine Muttersprache, he'd say, my, my mother tongue. He came to life at these. He liked uh, sort of cafe society life. I mean, New York being the capital of cafe society, I mean, that she, she flourished. I mean, she came into her own in, in New York, whereas uh, she didn't so much in, in Paris, I feel. And uh, she had a ball. I don't think he did. The Duke was devoted to the Duchess but not to all her friends, especially when stories appeared in the gossip columns about a liaison with a notorious socialite, Jimmy Donahue. He's someone who degraded people, and I think that he liked the idea of, of, of having an affair with the Duchess. It was a feather in his cap. I don't think it probably was a very passionate affair, but I think that somehow he got her absolutely trapped. She was fascinated by him. And also, what she liked in New York was going out on the town. He liked to go out on the town, so, I mean, they would spend... what. She 
He was a companion to go to nightclubs and to sit around in old Morocco, wherever it was, and he was perfect for that, and he was very funny. I think that at some periods, life became so dull that she really needed somebody who was going to amuse her, and Jimmy Donahue was extremely amusing, as very often very gay and outwardly gay men are. I mean, for instance, I remember one time when somebody asked Jimmy, uh, asked Jimmy Donahue what the Duchess was like in bed, and he said, my dear, it was like going to bed with a very old sailor. A much publicised show of affection brought the affair to an end. The Duke, on the other hand, had an affair of a very different kind, with money. The Duke, most afternoons, would come up at four o'clock and he and Nate would discuss his investments and his portfolio. And I don't know whether I should say this or not, but it was $10 million, which is not what a king has to live on. There was a lot of discussion about their getting everything for free and they didn't pay here and they didn't pay there. But Nate checked with the Waldorf and they said he paid weekly, right on time, never try to get anything for nothing. One uh, evening, uh, the Duke approached my husband and says, now, Monsieur Masson, you have to explain to me why my checks are not cashed. And uh, Charles says, yes, my wife <laughs> kept your checks. <laughs> And the Duke uh, paused for a while and said, well, they have to be deposited. So Charles says, is it a royal command? And the Duke said, yes, it is. Wallace adored jewels. She was very knowledgeable about them, and during the 36 years of their marriage, the Duke must have spent hundreds of thousands of pounds buying them for her. Some came from here, Harry Winston's place on Fifth Avenue. From this house, they preferred the fabulous. In fact, their first purchase was a pair of yellow pear-shaped diamonds. They were approximately 45 carats each, and they were mounted as clips. And when the Duchess received these di diamonds, one wonders if she might have said the same thing when she first saw the Duke. And I have worn them twice, and they have caused a sensation. The Duke was brought up with this. He was used to women wearing this kind of thing. He took it as just second nature. And I imagine that he wished his wife to have that. Wallace became associated with jewellery more than probably any other woman this century. On one occasion, she asked Winston's to make up a necklace from a priceless collection of jewels purchased in India from a Maharani. These were among the most spectacular probably ever conceived, with seven or eight hundred carats of beautiful emeralds, rose diamonds, which are all cut diamonds. And Mr. Winston took these and created necklaces out of them, which the Duchess of Windsor fell in love with. Well, the first time she wore them at a ball in Paris, one of the Maharani's said, what's the big deal? I used to wear those on my ankles. <laughs> and it was right after this party, in fact, I would imagine before she got in the car, the Duchess of Windsor took these off her neck and never put them back on again, refused to wear them. New York seemed to suit the Duchess's interests far more than the Duke. However, for him, the real attraction of America was the opportunity to get business tips on his investments and the sport. But for that, he had to leave the city. Most weekends, they would make for the country and places like Locust Valley on Long Island to lovely old houses like this one, owned by the Slater family. There are still lots of reminders of their stays here in what was the Duke's guest bedroom. And there's a feeling of informality and peace in this house. Long Island was where the Windsors could relax, with friends who invited them for holidays and to satisfy their love of life's little luxuries. Hostess Martha Slater plied them with gifts and made sure they never ran out of caviar. That's something, that's something up. <laughs> oh, rather dishevelled, Duke. It's rather unusual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that splendid garden. Absolutely stunning. <laughs> And those are a great pair of boots. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's shooting here, is it? What, what would yeah, you? Yeah, down what? Tallahassee, Florida. Yeah, in Florida. Mm -hmm. And that's CZ Guest, right? I think he loved to reminisce, especially with me, because he knew I loved to hunt so much. I know he loved riding. And when they come in January, they go to a horseshoe plantation, Mrs. Baker's shooting place, for two weeks. Then they'd come to Palm Beach and maybe stay with us for a week, and then move. On. 
at our house. It was very well organized. They slept in the same bed every night, and they used to have little giggles to each other. They had a lot of little giggles, you know. And then he'd often say to me, have you had any Mr. and Mrs.? And I said, not lately, sir. <laughs> you know, you've always asked me. Things like that. And the president and Mrs. Nixon had a dinner for them. Oh, it's the most lovely dinner. Arnold Palmer flew in on his plane, and I sat next to one of the astronauts. And it was a fabulous evening. It was beautiful. And, of course, he was the star of the evening. He gave us a very short speech after dessert. And uh, everyone fell in love with him, really. The charm of that man. In the exclusive country clubs of Long Island, the Duke could practice his favorite game, golf. The sport he took up after an accident forced him to give up horse riding. He loved it, and although he never became very good at it, it must have been a wonderful escape from the social chit-chat and gossip. They were literally the king and queen of America's cafe society, and were treated as stars. It may all sound very glamorous, but most of the time it was unfulfilling. And worst of all, so shallow. They were no more at home here than in Europe. The Windsors ended up living in France, principally because they were offered tax-free status. That was a major concern of the Duke's, influencing not just where he lived, but also where he might take a job. La Croix, in the south of France, was their initial home. Once one of the most desirable properties on the Cap d'Antibes, it is now just a burned-out shell. Without their scrapbooks and the Windsor's own photo albums, it is difficult to imagine what a fashionable and stylish place it must have been and how much fun it was. But the Riviera lost its appeal after the war, and by the 1950s, the Windsors were firmly established in Paris. Any hope of living permanently in Britain had utterly faded. But in fact, the Duke was able to make several discreet visits. Of course, he did come quite often on visits, but they were always very invisible visits. Not always, but almost always. Sometimes there would be a picture of him going to, to Marlborough House to see Queen Mary. But they were not very publicised visits, not as they would be now. There is one home that most closely resembles the life he left behind in Britain. Did Mill, the only property the Windsors ever bought. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we used to go to Old Mill House. They couldn't have many people for dinner there. It was only about 12. But their Sunday lunch, there was always be 24 people. Just remembering how elaborate the tea service was in the mill, with maids dressed all in green and white, bearing those organdy claws so there wouldn't be a crease in them. Uh, and then going through, I really mean it, a high tea, I mean, it could have been dinner. As a matter of fact, in the mill, after this enormous display, the Duke would look at his watch and he'd say, all right, five o'clock, time for cocktails. And there was a little room that led out of the main salon, and the Duke would get behind the bar, none of the servants were allowed in, and he loved to play bartender. The secretary called him, I want to know what kind of a drink they wanted, so it'd be on the tray when they arrived. And whether it was a short dress or a long dress, and always very considerate, so you didn't feel out of place. After lunch on the terrace, they would all play canasta, and the Duke quite often didn't want to play, and he'd take me and go down the hill and across a little stream into his sort of sanctum, which was an old barn, and we would go gardening, I'd push the wheelbarrow. Sometimes he would say things to me like, don't ever waste your life, Atlanta, always know what you want to do and always enjoy doing what you want to do. Certainly to me, he seemed a sad person and quite often rather bored. There weren't a great many people in Paris who were really good friends of the Windsors. To me, it seemed as though everybody was still sort of scratching and fighting about who did or who didn't um, collaborate. But there was so much snobbery and the eternal petty spites of a very fragile and it seemed to me shallow world they all lived in. When you went there for the weekend, it was charming even when we were four, they were there with the dogs, the pugs. It was tellement gentil. The Duchess is dancing. 
Like the, the Duke always wearing his kilt for the evening, the dog running around. C'était gentil. You think you were staying with old friends? Very simple. They like to laugh, to have fun. So it was marvelous. Mm. And, and you could forget where you were. The famous day when Armstrong put his foot on the moon, the Duke said, it's going to be at 2 o'clock in the morning, and he will send Sydney to wake me up, to wake Philip. He had a TV and a little room next to the big drawing room. We went to see that. We see the Duke waiting there. And the Duke said, where is the Duchess? And one of the George said, the Duchess doesn't want to come with no makeup or what. She didn't come. And when he put his foot on the moon, the Duke was so emotional, he almost cried. He said, wonderful people, American, wonderful people. He was too shaky. And for this garden house seems to sum up best the character and personality of my great uncle. And it is here that I felt the closest to him. Each dog, well, there were three or four of them, Sidney or George carried plates, and the Duke took the plate and put it on the ground for each dog on a little mat. And the one that was supposed to go there wanted to go there. The one that he wanted to go there wanted to go there, and the Duke was furious. I believe he had a baguette in his hand, and together with that he'd say, no, you go there, you go there, and you go there. And I said to myself, my God, when I think that he was the king of England with all this colonial empire, and then suddenly to see him fighting with all his dogs, made me dreadfully sad. You see what I mean? That made me unhappy for the Duke's life, and for all he represented. They were their children. That's all that they had. And they adored his dogs, especially his royal highness. He always had dogs. Halfway up a small hill overlooking the mill is probably the most poignant reminder of the Windsor's life here. A small collection of gravestones to their beloved pug dogs. The Duke and Duchess had no children. In fact, she was unable to. So with the contents of the house sold, the gardens a shadow of their former selves, this is their only legacy. As a couple, I thought they were terribly sad. I thought that he occasionally a look come into his eyes of such melancholy that he'd given it all up for this terrible second-rate life in this or that city in Palm Beach or New York or wherever it might be. And um, I think he realised that, that he'd made a mistake. He'd committed himself to her, and to that extent he was a marvellous husband to her. But I would think that this was largely good manners, and there was something tragic about the relationship. She seemed to be perfectly happy about everything, but even she must have had moments of remorse. I think she really meant it when she said she didn't want him to give up the throne, because I think she realised what was going to happen, that I don't think he did. But he certainly came to that realization. I asked him if he regretted what he did. That's all I said to him. And he said, no, not at all. That's all. No. Do you two ever have occasion to discuss what might have been? Um, Mr. Mara, uh, I, I think you must be referring to, um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the events of 1900, uh, the crucial events in, in my life and I and since that time. Well, now, the answer is most emphatically no. We both feel that there is no more wasteful or foolish or frustrating exercise than trying to penetrate the fiction of what might have been. There they were, like Becky Sharp, really, at the end of Vanity Fair. I mean, condemned to lead this sort of terrible life from one pleasure place to another, not clearly really having a very good time and not having really old, dependable friends. The late 1960s was a turning point for the Duke and Duchess. The gradual reconciliation with his family was acknowledged when they were both invited to the formal unveiling of a memorial plaque to Queen Mary in 1967. By now they were in their 70s, and it was also the beginning of the end. A series of illnesses and operations afflicted the Duke, and the last and most serious being the detection of cancer. It was pretty easy to detect a tumour on his tonsil, on his left tonsil, it was a cancerous uh, lesion, which uh, very quickly got out of control. It was beyond any uh, attempt, uh, surgical attempt, nothing was, could be done. He knew that he had cancer of the throat, but he never, 
never complain. He was really very, very sick. And that's when Winston told, called up Dickie Mountbatten and said, perhaps the Queen should know how ill he was. I don't really think, to be fair to the Duchess, I don't think she had a clue how sick he was. Because about three years before, she was really losing her memory very seriously. And the Duke talked to Winston and I about it. And he didn't want anybody to know. She was very feeble and maybe this affected her memory. He was devastated at the thought, always thought, what will happen if I should disappear first? He knew that she would be very vulnerable and that there would be a lot of vultures around. In 1972, Queen Elizabeth was due to make her first state visit to France. The British ambassador, Sir Christopher Soames, was desperate that nothing should go wrong. He contacted Dr. Tain. Sir so Christopher explained that if it happened that the Duke died during the royal visit, of course, it would, half of it would have to be cancelled. The Queen would have to go back to Windsor and so on. And they were very worried about this. And I remember Sir Christopher said to me, look here, Doctor, the Duke's got to die before or after the visit, but not during. <laughs> what can I do, sir? <laughs> Despite his illness, the Duke was determined to receive the Queen at the villa. Elaborate preparations had to be made. Our first idea was to invite Her Majesty to come to see her uncle in his bed. But the Duke said, no, no, this is not convenient. So we uh, set the IV drip and the, the tube was coming out of his shirt at the back there. Where I am here, you see. And uh, the... The flask containing the serum was hidden behind the, that curtain here. And it worked well. You, you couldn't see a thing uh, when, uh, when you walked. But then the unexpected thing turned, uh, happened. He wanted to stand up when the Queen came in. Now, that was not foreseen at all. I thought that was really something. He could hardly stand up. But he wanted to, to greet uh, the sovereign. After the visit of Her Majesty, the Duke's deterioration was read. That morning he sat down and he took up his pen, but he couldn't write. You probably are weak. I said, you haven't eaten for so long. Why don't you let me go get you some fin and haddock and buttered eggs? That's your favourite breakfast. Sidney said, that is far behind me now. But I tell you what I like to have. I like to have some fresh peaches and cream. And I fed him. And I put him back into his bed. The little dog was on the bed with him. And when I came in at about six o'clock, he was still sleeping. And I said to Royal Highness, I said, His Royal Highness is resting very late this evening. He said, Sidney, don't worry. Leave him. He's tired. Let him rest. And about eight o'clock, I came back. The little dog jumped off the bed and he ran into the boudoir and he jumped on a Royal Highness lap and never came back. And I said, This is very strange. I didn't say anything else. I stepped off the bedroom and that very night, His Royal Highness died. His funeral took place in St. George's Chapel, Windsor, in June 1972. He was 77. The ceremony acknowledged him as a former king and was conducted amidst an atmosphere of reconciliation and forgiveness. In death as in life, the Duke of Windsor was a man of contradictions. After years of being distanced from the throne and any memory of his short, unconsummated reign, here he was being buried with full honours. As a young man, he had become an immensely popular Prince of Wales, by going out amongst the people like no other member of the royal family had done before. Yet, just as they needed him most, on the point of becoming king, he walked out on them. He was the pinnacle of society, yet he openly defied the social mores of the day. He was stubborn, selfish and self-centred, yet at the same time, charming and charismatic. People really liked him. He was openly a patriot, professing love for his country and allegiance to his brother, King George. And yet, he is condemned by some as a collaborator, or even worse, a traitor. But no matter how hard they try, no one has ever uncovered any evidence for that. So, deprived of proof, they maintain that there has been, and whatever you may believe, we are all left with the question, is it possible, from all that we know about the Duke's life, that he would have seriously considered betraying his country? I honestly believe not. And the final contradiction is that in marriage, he had split his family and his country. In grief, he united them. For the first time, the royal family gathered with Wallace, Duchess of Windsor. When the Duke actually died, she was awfully shocked. Uh, the 
tremendous change in her, her life. And then the, the, the ceremony of the burial was, it was terrible for her. Meeting suddenly hundreds of persons whom she didn't know being taken to Buckingham Palace. And I found her in uh, Windsor Castle. She was there alone uh, on the sofa. It was rather pathetic, really. But then she was taken back here, and when she walked into the, the house, she, she called David. David! I think that she began to drink a little after the Duke's death. She found herself with a lot less invitations and even made phone calls in order to get invitations. You see, it was terrible. Everything I heard was as if she were surrounded by a sort of wall of silence. I called George, and I told George I wanted to come out to see her. And he said, of course. And I said, please be down at the gate and let me in. And I think they were dying for me to come. So I went. And it was just the saddest day to see that house, because a lot of the things were missing. This poor old lady, a prisoner in her own house, she didn't know who she was or where she was, really. She recognized me immediately. She told George, we're going to have a dinner party tomorrow night for Miss Ernst. I know, I know. That was, but she was in bed, very, very old. It was over for her. With the Duchess vulnerable, her worried servants used the Duke's bath with its wooden cover as an ideal hiding place for the letters and photographs of Britain's greatest love story, save from those who might see them as a source of income. In charge of affairs at the Bois de Boulogne was Maitre Bloom, the Windsor's lawyer. There was nothing we could do without Ma Madame Bloom. I mean, she took over completely. Maitre Bloom and the Swiss banker had everything all tied up. Of course, uh, I knew what was in the will. Uh, but how did you know the contents of the will? Uh, because I, I, I was aware of what was going on with, uh, with, uh, with the lawyer, whose doctor I was also. <laughs> Oh, I see, right. <laughs> so right. it was a, a lot, sort of little club around the Duchess to protect her. With the help of her French lawyer, she changed her will so that after her death, the Windsor's belongings were auctioned for $50 million, which benefited a French charity. Not many years after the Institut Pasteur got that enormous amount of money, they discovered the uh, virus to AIDS. Sometimes I think if it's the most useful thing the Windsors did in their life <laughs> is to give their, uh, their fortune to the Institut Pasteur. So unfortunately, she went down, down after his royal highness dead. She couldn't seem to pull herself together anymore. I don't think really she really realized what she had, but after his royal highness dead, she missed him terribly. Then finally she took the head, she had a stroke, and that was the end of it. She never regained any conscience after she just lied in, suffered for 11 years. The great love affair was in, it was finished. comes full circle. It was from Windsor that the Duke started on his road to exile, and it was to here he returned 35 years later to be buried. But it was only after the Duchess died in 1986 that his expectations were at last fulfilled. For down there, in the shadow of Queen Victoria's and Prince Albert's mausoleum, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor lie side by side in a quiet corner of England, equals at last in the country he loved, their exile over.